And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And, he bless, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John, Baptist, John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and ye say he hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold a man gluttonous, and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Then began he to embrace the cities wherein most his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. And I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemeth good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Take my yoke, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Holy Father, I thank you, God, for your word, Lord. I thank you for this chapter of scriptures, even as I read it, Lord, it, it speaks to my heart so many truths, God, um, and we have so little time to expound upon them. I pray, God, you would, um, through me, Lord, do a wonderful work, Lord. Strengthen those that are here. Uh, give them the encouragement, Lord, that they need. Teach them truths, Lord, from your word, that we would grow thereby. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to focus in on Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. The Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. Misconceptions on meekness. Misconceptions on meekness is what I want to talk about. Jesus Christ here says of himself, I am meek. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul speaks of the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And if we're to follow in Christ's steps, I believe that we too ought to exhibit the same meekness that Christ exhibited. And here is just one of the many examples where, yes, he says, I am meek and lowly of hearts. But the example of his behavior is shown in that his meekness causes him to engage people. It teaches him to seek people. It teaches him, it shows him inviting people to come unto him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now if we were to look at the definition here then of, of meekness, and I should have had it already pulled up, meekness then is an attitude of human nature and behavior. It has been defined several ways, righteous, humble, teachable, and patient under suffering, long-suffering, willing to follow gospel teachings. Meekness is an attribute of a true disciple. Meekness has been contrasted with humility as referring to behavior towards others, whereas humility refers to an attitude towards oneself. In other words, humility is the attitude towards self. Meekness is that expressed unto others. Meekness, meaning restraining one's own powers so as to allow room for others. Humbly patient or docile as under provocation from others. So meekness then is the restraint of one's own power so as to allow room for others. We see then that definition there is uh, s similar to uh, a righteous, humble, teachable, patient under suffering attitude that is willing to follow then the gospel teachings of Christ. That is how meekness expresses itself. Restraining your own power so as to allow room for others. So one of the misconceptions of meekness that I first want to deal with is though it is often perceived, it is often viewed as this, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. Rather, meekness is appropriate power. In other words, it is exhibiting power in the appropriate situations. How can meekness be weakness when Christ himself said, I am meek? Turn to Psalm 45, if you will. Psalm 45. The Bible says in Psalm 45, Psalm 45 and verse 1, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. We see here, and I think it goes back and forth to read, between talking about God himself and also talking about the king upon earth as the ready writer is performing the writing touching the king or regarding the king. He says things like, he is well favored. The king is blessed. The king is above all his fellows. The king is, is, is one that is prosperous. Many people fall before this king. And then that famous verse from Hebrews, it says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. And it says he is anointed with gladness above his fellows. This king is above. This king is prospering. This king is favored. This king is blessed. And yet in there it says he is prosperous, in verse 4, because of truth and meekness and righteousness. Too often, I think, be, meekness comes off as weakness, but we see the definition, we see the um, application towards this king, towards uh, touching this king as one of great power, 
of great influence, of great control, of great um, overcoming ability. And yet he's described as being meek. He's described as having the truth and of having right, righteousness upon him. Christ said he is meek. And even so this description of a king, whomsoever it would be in the context, the king is great. The king is strong. The king is powerful. And yet it's appropriated power. It's appropriate power. Meekness is not weakness. Look at Psalm 22 and in verse 26. Psalm 22 and in verse 26. I'm going to run through these fast. Psalm 22 and 26. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. So there's, there's an, uh, a provision to the meek. There's praise of the Lord, those that seek him in meekness. Your heart shall live forever, meek. Those that are meek. There is that power that they have in order to have provision of God. And yet meekness is often portrayed as if it was weakness. Psalm chapter 25 and verse 9 says, The meek will he guide in judgment. And the meek will, te will he teach his way. If you're following the way of the Lord, if you're taught in the ways of the Lord, and you're guided within the judgments of God, how can that be perceived as weakness? Who can overcome but the man that keeps the word? Who can overcome but the man that, that is, is within the guidance of God and his judgments and his ways and following in his path? He is going to be able to overcome the temptations that come on this world. He is able to overcome the trials that come upon this world in his flesh. And yet, the world often perceives meekness as weakness. And yet, if he's within the realm of God's judgment and he's learning the way of God, that can't be so. Meekness can't be weakness. It's appropriate power. Psalm chapter 37, Psalm 37 and verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Quite often peace is achieved when, when especially abundant peace, when there is a lack of enemies. In other words, there's no one going to be able to stand before the meek as they inherit the earth. The peace is, is, is just becoming them. The peace is around them because they are meek. Or because God gives that peace unto the meek. You think of somebody that has inherited the earth, and in our day, they're going to be subject to many attacks. There's going to be no peace for the person that has inherited the earth, and yet the meek, the Bible says here, shall inherit the earth. What power is available unto those that are meek? They're delighting themselves in the abundance of peace. I will hazard to say that this is not the peace which the world gives. This is the peace that passeth all understanding, available to the meek. Yes, one day we will inherit the world. Yes, one day we will inherit the earth. But the peace being talked about here passeth all understanding. It is the peace that only Christ will give unto his people. Psalm 147. Psalm 147. The Bible says in verse 6, Psalm 147 and verse 6, The Lord lifteth up the meek, and casteth the wicked down to the ground. And there's your, there's your reason why there's such peace to the meek. Because it is God that holds them in his very hands and lifts them to the heights whereunto they cannot attain without him. He takes then the wicked and casteth them down to the ground, to the lowest point in contrast to the living God up there in the third heaven, lifting up his meek, lifting up his people, casting down the wicked to the ground. The polar opposites, you're in the dust if you're wicked, and yet the meek is lifted up on high by the power of the living God. So we see then that meekness is not weakness. It cannot be. It's appropriate power upon the person. Why? Because the meek rely on the power of God. The power of God is what is, what is in them, is what gives the provision for them to overcome the adversaries, to overcome the adversities, to overcome the strife, the temptations, the trouble, the anguish that they're going on while they're in this world. Meekness is an attitude that allows somebody to rely on the living God. And look, when you rely on the living God, hey, you're lift up and you're cast down if you don't, if you're wicked in contrast. Remember, James said, he said, remember the patience of Job. You have heard of it, right? You have heard of the patience of Job. And Job said these wonderful words. He says, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And that's what the meek does. They trust in God, though their circumstance may not portray 
a, a, a great joy, a great, a great triumph, a great overcoming, a great happiness, or whatever the case may be. May we, we may look at the meek and someone like Job, who, who has this patience to get through a trial. We may look at him and say, man, like his friends did. We may look at him and say, man, Job, what are you doing? You've obviously angered the Lord. And the strife and the attacks and the, and the pressing down of the world comes upon him. And though Job misinterpreted what was happening to him as the Lord slaying him or the Lord removing a blessing or the Lord doing something in his life, though he misunderstood that it was in fact the devil, yes, under the release of God, under the um, allowance of God to go and perform those things. Though Job misunderstood what was happening and why it was happening and to whom was responsible for it, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though God is working in my life in ways I can't understand, and they hurt, I will trust Him. When the meek is pressed down, when the meek is beaten, they receive it and they grow. When things that are pressed down, they become dense. And the picture is clear. When somebody is pressed under the weight of the cares and the troubles and the strifes and the worries of this world, their makeup becomes more dense. Their makeup becomes tougher. You take anything and you squish it down as far as you can. It becomes tougher. Yeah, it's a different shape now. Yeah, it's perhaps smaller, maybe in its own eyes. But that thing is now denser. It is stronger in the end. And Christian, hey, if God is pressing you down, if God is allowing you to be beaten, if you are under the weight of the world upon your shoulders, hey, receive that and grow. God may be using that situation because you're a meek person to allow you to be strengthened by it. And that's something that meekness is. It's not weakness. It's just power that's used at appropriate times. Meekness allows you to be joyful in all circumstances. If you will be meek, you shall have joy. God allows for people to have that restraint. See, like I said, meekness is appropriate power. It's, it's having restraint over your power. And if God has you in a, in a crunch, if God has you pressed, if God has you in a, in a struggle, in a, in a difficult situation... As long as you can maintain meekness. Hey, I may have the power to get out of my situation of myself, but if I'm meek, I'm going to withhold that power and use it for a more appropriate time down the road. I'm going to allow the pressing to come upon me. I'm going to allow the struggle to come upon me. And though I may have power to act out at my own accord and rise out of the struggle that I am in, I, as a meek person, should show restraint. And when I show restraint upon using my own power to get out of whatever situation I am in, when I restrict myself of using the power that I have to get out of the, the hole that I currently am in, God gets the glory. Because I am allowing not for myself to overcome the situation and get out of it, but I am showing restraint upon the power that I have to overcome such and such a situation. In the end, allowing for God to get the glory over that. And that's what meekness is. Meekness is not allowing my power, not doing things in my power, in my strength, though I might be able to. I might be able to, in my strength, do certain things that would get me out of certain situations. But if I use that power instead at an appropriate time, later date, meekness allows for God to overcome for me, God to work through me, and God to give the glory unto himself. The meek also, in Isaiah chapter 29 says, the meek also shall increase their joy. And I want to bring this to, to light because meekness, again, a lot of people think of it as weakness. They think of it as something lowly, something defeated, something um, of no value. Meekness is looked at in this world as, as a, a character flaw. People shouldn't be meek. They should be strong-willed, independent, doing their own thing. But the reality is, is that meekness, the Bible says here, the meek shall also increase their joy in the Lord. 
That's contrary to what the world teaches. The joy of the world comes from making your own path, doing your own thing, being free, uh, you know, get in the car, get in the house, working your tail off in order to just grow and grow and grow, even stepping on others. But the joy that they experience is not. It is right. nothing. They're not going to have joy from the things of this world. Hey, but Christian, you can have joy from being meek. Yeah. You'll increase your joy in the Lord. Look, nothing. Nothing can stop a joyful Christian. There ain't nothing that can stop a joyful Christian. My pastor just preached through Philippians on Wednesday nights. And if you read through Philippians, it's all about choosing joy. Choosing to have a joyful Christian life. And as you read through Philippians, one thing you will not find in the context of that entire book is sin. Joyful life comes from being weak, meek, and it also comes from being without sin. Sin will rob you of your joy. Yep. And therefore, you don't even see it in the context of the joyful Christian life, which I believe that that book is trying to portray. But as you read that, you see a single mind. You see a mind that is willing to serve, submit, be spiritual, and sincere, and secure. That's what you read. Look at Philippians chapter 1 when you get a chance. Philippians chapter 1, you'll find the single mind. Philippians chapter 2, you'll find the submissive mind. Philippians chapter 3, you'll find the spiritual mind. In Philippians chapter 4, there is a secure mind. And then that whole of the scriptures, that whole passage uh, that God gives to us through the church of Philippi, through the apostle Paul, through the leading of the Holy Ghost, it all accumulates in this great statement, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Amen. That joy comes from being meek. When you're meek, you increase in joy. That whole book, I believe, is teaching about how to be a joyful Christian. It is telling you your mind's got to be single, submissive, spiritual, and secure in Christ. Because I can do all things through Christ. What a joy that is. And it comes through the vehicle of meekness in a Christian's life. Meekness is not weakness. That's one of the first misconceptions of meekness. They'll say, oh, that's, that's meekness. No, that's just power used appropriately. That's just, that's just power used in the right place. The next misconception about meekness is that meekness is for followers. Meekness is for subservient people. Meekness is for those that are, are being led about. But the reality is that meekness is a virtue of great leaders. Great leaders in the church. Great leaders in the congregation, the church of the wilderness in the Old Testament. Great leaders of the New Testament church. Great leaders in our church. Dads, hey moms, older to younger, great leaders must be meek. Great leaders must have a meek spirit. And here's our great example, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ is described in Matthew chapter 21. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. Our Lord, our Savior, our King of kings, our Lord of lords, our great God of heaven and of earth, who spoke the world into existence, is here, portrayed, here in person, here in flesh. That requires meekness all of its own to become flesh, right? To take his power and put it aside for an appropriate time. He meekly sat upon a foal of an ass as he rode in triumphantly into Jerusalem. And at the time, many received him great. They were, they were throwing down their clothing. They were throwing down palm leaves. They were saying, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest, right? He came and with great pomp and great circumstance. But though he was triumphant, and though he was entering in in a triumphal manner, he was meek. He was lowly, and he was a great leader, the greatest leader we've ever seen. Another example that we do have, maybe we can grasp a hold of a little bit easier, is that of Moses. Moses, the Bible says, Moses the man, the man Moses, was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. That's Numbers chapter 12. And you know what happened in Numbers chapter 12? People rose up against him. His, his number one and his number two, his sister and his, and his brother Aaron, rose up against him as the leadership because they had problems with how he was leading. They had problems with what he was doing. They had problems with whom he had married. They had problems with him. 
And as you learn about it, they, they, they start to bring up, well, you know, God spoke to all of us. So what was their problem was, oh, he had married this certain woman. Turned out to be, no, they had problems with religion. It seemed like the goalposts were constantly changing on what their exact problem was with Moses. But right there in verse 3, there's this great parenthesis as the whole story is unveiling. We know that the end of those two was not great. We know that Miriam required prayer in order that the leprosy would even come across her skin. God cursed her so badly for her rebellion against the man of God. But there in that parenthesis, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. So Moses himself exhibited meekness, and that was a great compliment. How would you know it was a great compliment, but that, hey, God himself, Jesus Christ, was meek himself. He said, come unto me, I am meek. And Moses was described as very weak above any man that were upon the face of the earth. Millions of people, millions, were constantly toward Moses, chiding, whispering backbiting, bringing contempt upon him, fighting against him, arguing against him, being stubborn, being rebellious. All of the things we know we read about time and time and time and time and time again, they would come at Moses if they were bold enough to do it face to face, or they would just be in the background causing strife and division. They were attacking the man of God. They were attacking the leadership. And yet that parenthesis is there. He was meek. He was lowly. I believe Moses here was exhibiting what we learned about in the first part, in that he had appropriate power. It was a weakness that Moses let these things happen to him. Why? Because he understood that though he's being attacked, as it plays out in Numbers chapter 12, God had his way with them. God set the record straight. God didn't allow for those that were chiding against the leadership, those that were backbiting the leadership, those that were fighting against Moses to overcome. He trusted in the Lord, and therefore in meekness, though Moses himself probably could have just lobbed the heads off of both of them. It, do we agree? Moses was a great leader. He was a great Amen. warrior. He, he had the ability, he had the power to take care of that rebellion himself. In meekness, he decided to withhold that power for an appropriate time. And he just simply allowed for God. What did God do? He called Moses, he called Miriam, and he called Aaron on the carpet, and he sorted it out. And he said, Who's, who's ever wrong will suffer. And the wrong came upon them. As they experienced the wrath of God for but a moment, Moses was delivered. He didn't have to use his power. He remained meek. And the Bible says he was meeker than any man. And that's one great thing that you see constantly, not just in Moses, but in many different examples in the Bible where men could very well have gotten themselves by their own power out of a situation. They had every ability to do it, and yet they exhibited meekness. The greatest example, I don't want to get ahead of myself, is of course Jesus Christ, who had the power to get out of what he was sent forth to do, and instead exhibited meekness that we could learn thereby. Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomy chapter 33. This is the heart of Moses here, I believe. Deuteronomy 33. We're going to look at verse 1 through 5. Deuteronomy 33. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. So here Moses, at the end of all of things he has been through. At the end of all the chiding, the backbiting, the hurt, the, the hatred, all the things that came upon him. And in the end, because of, because of one moment of weakness, he, he lost entering in to the promised land. He had every right then to be bitter. He had every right then to be angry at these people who had, quote, cost him what he felt he was promised, maybe, of the Lord. The promised land, right? He, he was designed to enter into that. But this is the blessing. This is the heart of Moses toward his people. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. And he shined forth from Mount Paran. And he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jeshurun when the heads of the people 
and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. This is another example where the man of God and God himself are almost changing positions throughout, throughout the statement, that, throughout the, the passage. Because we find here Moses commanding the law. Well, we, we know that God commanded the law unto Moses. Could it be that the will of God and the command of God through Moses ended up being one and the same at some point in this, in this, in this exchange? That the love where it says in verse 3, Yea, he loved the people, and all the saints are in thy hand. His love that God had exhibited into his heart through him towards the people became one and the same. Yea, he loved the people. I believe that also applies to Moses. And the saints are in his hand. And then there's that application where it says ten thousands of saints are at his right hand. Hey, there's a coming day when ten thousands of his saints shall march together. Lord knows. But it says here, he was king in Jeshurun. But what I wanted to point out is that word king. Well, when was Moses ever a king? Well, it says Moses commanded the law, and it says, and he was king. Those, that's, the, that's the antecedent to it. That's, that's the same context. And he was king. Referring to Moses being king in Jeshurun, when everyone was assembled together. The best I know is that Moses was a judge. The best I know is that Moses had many men that judged underneath him. He wasn't a king. And yet Moses, the man of God, loved these people in God's stead. And because he was meek, here in the context of scriptures, as the blessing is going forth, as Moses is about to rise up into heaven, he's about to, he's about to breathe his last breath here upon earth. He's described as a king in Jeshurun when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. This is never a, a statement that he would make about himself. He would never lift himself up as if he were a king. But God here allows for Moses to have that title as king. Great leader was Moses. Meekness is not for followers, though followers can exhibit meekness. Meekness is a virtue of great leaders. Moses here inherited what was described in Hebrews chapter 11. The great kingdom. The kingdom that comes by faith. The kingdom that comes to those that, that receive of the gift of faith, that believe on Christ, that act out in faith through the entirety of their life. The promise that, that many in the Old Testament never received. Here, Moses, as a meek and quiet leader, receives the gift of a kingdom. The Bible says, blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. The meek conquer. The meek overcome. The meek inherit glory. And even leaders, especially leaders, show meekness. Even when they're being forceful, even when they're being strong, it is one of the greatest attributes of a strong leader is that they would show forth meekness. Now we might think that that's a contrary thing, being forceful and being strong. But if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you'll see how this plays out. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 1, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Second Christ. Corinthians. Sorry? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present, that with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So this is how meekness acts itself out, even when someone is being forceful. The Apostle Paul is saying here, he says, Hey, I have been very bold toward you. And when I'm absent, I'm very bold toward you. But I think not that I should come with this same confidence. I'm hoping that I don't have to be bold when I'm present with you. He's, he's I believe, responding here to an accusation that comes to many meek leaders, an accusation that comes to many of those who are in leadership positions, and though, and, and because they understand that they can trust God in a situation to, to, to give somebody leprosy instead of having to take actions into their own hands, um, quite often people will look upon meek leaders and they will be accused of acting in the flesh when they act bold. And I think that's what the Apostle Paul is dealing with here. He is saying, hey, though we walk in the flesh, we do not 
War after the flesh. How often have I heard suddenly when there's a leader that's very, that's very meek, that's very mild, that tends to think things through, that tends to be more calm in situations when it gets intense. A, a leader that, that um, is the strong, silent type. Um, some of us have had dads that were like that. We quite often would look at a situation when that person gets angry, when that person gets forceful, when that person gets bold, and people would just be like, ah, it's just him acting in the flesh. Couldn't be further from the truth. The man that shows meekness and is quiet and is subdued and has power reserved for the appropriate times is actually showing great spiritual strength. He's trusting the Lord to finish the work. He's trusting the Lord to get his revenge, to do what the Lord does. And only once when, when he's led of God, only once when it becomes that appropriate time and that meekness then comes out in a forceful and strong and bold manner, do you see the fullness of what meekness actually is? Meekness is strength and it's appropriate strength. Meekness is power, but it's reserved until the time when it's specifically needed. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is also not just for followers, just for quiet um, people that are just always being pushed around. Meekness acts itself out in two forms. It acts itself, yes, in the quiet, in the, in the, in the tame, in the reserved, in the, uh, in, the, <clears throat> in the way Moses did where he simply just allowed um, what was going on, the rebellion that was going on to come at him and simply did not react but allowed God, God to speak through it. But then he, like the Apostle Paul, eventually will act out with power, will act out with might. And that's what meekness does. It waits, it reserves, it withholds, it, it, it keeps back the, the power, it keeps back the boldness in order that it would be used for an appropriate time period. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy, um, the Bible says, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure would grant them repentance. If we we'll turn there, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive. And this is key. The Bible says in verse 23, foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. It shows meekness when you avoid foolish and unlearned questions. When you hold in reserve, and again, we just talked about it, that, that we all need to grow in this area, to not get involved and not feel the need to always defend ourselves, to not feel the need to answer. Remember, the Bible has a twofold answering of a matter, right? You answer the fool according to their folly, or you don't answer the fool according to the folly, lest you be like unto them. We need to, in meekness, understand that there is a time to answer, and there's a time to not answer, but foolish and unlearned questions are always in the don't answer category. Avoid them, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the Bible says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. Who wants to be a servant of the Lord here? Well, we must not strive. We must be gentle unto all men. We must be, again, here it says, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, in other words, appropriate power, with reserve, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And that's exactly what happens when someone comes at you with a foolish and unlearned question. They're opposing themselves. They're uh, fighting against themselves. They're quite often, the things that they're bringing up, they are, are pictures of their own body, of their own self, of their own actions. They're trying to put on someone else. But when meekness, we are, as the servants of the Lord, to uh, instruct those that oppose themselves. We're not to strive. We're not to debate. We're not to get involved in, in strife not belonging to us. We're not going to get involved in strife that does belong to us. We should avoid this kind of stuff. But in meekness, we're to instruct those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure, if God maybe will give them repentance unto the acknowledging the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by his will, taken captive by the will of them. So this is the boldness I believe that the Apostle Paul often portrayed. He was constantly being charged as in the person, having a, a, a weak demeanor, having a quietness about him. Um, he, he, his speech was contemptible. There was nothing in them that they should behold some glory. Some, he wasn't some great orator. He wasn't, just, he wasn't just beaming with talent. And yet, he was able to, in meekness, instruct those that oppose themselves. He was able to be bold, both in person and through the words that he wrote. But he did it appropriately. 
He did it at the right time. And because he did that, the Apostle Paul is revered as a great leader. Because he showed meekness in instructing people, because he showed meekness of leading people to the truth, because he showed meekness by avoiding foolish and unlearned questions, because he showed meekness by staying out of the strife, he was able to say, hey, God may be, God peradventure will give them repentance unto the acknowledging the truth. This is how he's thought that it would be best. This is how the Bible says it would be best to reach those that are in opposition to their own selves, that are hurting their own selves with their own actions, that are exposing their own foolishness with their own stupidity, that they're just beaming with these, these words. They're just shooting at these slanderous words. They're sending out all of these questions. And they're, and they're trying to find something to pin on the Apostle Paul. And they're trying to find, even on Jesus Christ himself, they're trying to push against the leadership that was in front of them. They're trying to push against the man of God that was in front of them. The Apostle Paul could say, hey, if I'm meek, if I instruct them, though they're opposing themselves, hey, God peradventure will give them repentance unto the acknowledging the truth. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who's taken captive by him at his will. They are taken captive of the devil at the devil's own will. And that's what happens when we get into strife. Who's been there? Where suddenly you're saying things you ought not say. Suddenly you're doing things you ought not do. Because you got involved in some sort of foolish and unlearned cycle and circle of questions. That's not meekness. Meekness withholds yourself from those situations. And as Moses did, just waited for God to speak and say, Miriam, Aaron, Moses, stand here. And then he judged. And we need to do the same thing. We need to understand that, hey, this is a spiritual battle. This isn't a carnal battle. And though we may have power, and here's the foolish unlearned question idea. Maybe we have the, the answer. We have the perfect thing to say to somebody in a strifeful situation. Um, if we were to just withhold that, who knows what God might do to get glory to himself? Who knows what God might do to bring light unto a situation that I just ruined, that I just negated, that I just destroyed the working of God, God getting the glory through a situation because I thought that in my own power I had the ability to get out of the situation myself. I had the ability to, um, not in meekness, but with power, instruct those that oppose themselves. I'm going to tell them. I'm going to show them. I'm going to get it right. I'm going to straighten them out. No, that's wrong. That's not meekness. We need to be meek. That's what leaders need to do. That's what leaders need to be. And meekness instructing those. And the purpose and the point of being meek is order that ye may recover. Look at that last verse. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Restoration. Restoration comes through the meek spiritual leader. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. So this man is at fault. This man is to be blamed. Here it says, Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So if you're going to take the spiritual stance, if you're going to be the spiritual one, if you're going to be the leader, taking the high road, if you're going to be after God's own heart, if you are to be in the spirit, you need to be in the spirit of meekness when someone is taken with a fall, when someone is overtaken with a fall. We just read that the, the snare is that of the devil, caught in, in the will of the devil and trapped in this own cycle, and we're just begging God that he would remove them from this. But if we are going to be meek, that's the only way we're going to get results out of this. It's the only way we're going to get somebody removed from that. We need to be spiritual. And the spiritual one is meek, and the spiritual one seeks to restore that one in that same spirit, the spirit of meekness, considering also thyself. So this is what ends up happening. We need to help even when it hurts, even when somebody's coming at us, even when somebody is trying to hurt us and attack us and saying mean things and saying wrong things about us. We need to just simply receive that. We need to accept that, that somebody's speaking against us. Why? Because otherwise we're going to get caught in this game of blame and defense and fighting and bickering and strife, and it's just never going to end, and that person won't be restored. But if God comes in, if the Spirit comes in, if that same spirit of weakness is allowed into a situation, hey, that's when great victory comes, and that's when somebody can be restored. The Bible says uh, that meekness is not weakness, I believe. The Bible says it's rather appropriate power. The Bible says meekness is not just for followers, but it's a virtue of great leaders. The Bible also says meekness is not passive. 
But rather, I believe meekness gets results. If you continue reading down Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. So we saw, first of all, that meekness restores. We also see that meekness bears the burdens of others. It takes upon the weight, it takes upon the struggles, it takes upon the trials of others, and is bared upon the one that is meek. Meekness thinks rightly about self. In other words, it's not going to think of itself to be something. Meekness thinks of self to be, to be even keeled, to be nothing but for the glory of Christ, but for Christ working in us. Meekness also rejoices in labors, labors that are proved, labors that are, are shown forth with, with consistently, shown forth with stability, shown forth with righteousness, and, and, and always in the same place, at the same time, on time, those labors happen. Meekness also is taught of good things and teaches others in good things. We're to have a meek and quiet spirit. First Peter chapter three and verse four. First Peter chapter three and verse four talks about the woman that is to have a meek and quiet spirit. First Peter chapter three and verse four. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. That great price is the meekness of the woman. That ornament is what she wears, and it's one that is not corruptible. That, that is the most beautiful ornament here that a woman could have upon her. Mm. It's not passive, but it does, I believe, get results. And you see that in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 as you look down. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And that's what we were talking about, is how the person that is meek can have a clear conscience, and even though people are speaking evil against them, in the end, they will be the ones that are ashamed. Now, it's not the meek person that is going to put them to shame, but rather the conversation of the meek person. It's not passive, but it's getting stuff done. It's getting things done. Why? Because they're meek. They're reserved. They're not going to get involved. They're not going to find themselves in the battle with the person that is speaking against them. Rather, they are going to let God bring that person to shame. They're being falsely accused. But it's all because of their good conversation in Christ. You don't think God's going to defend the person that is being attacked because of their good conversation in Christ? Of course God's going to readily and speedily come to that person's defense. And that's how meekness gets things done. It gets things done because the meek person just keeps doing the business of God, keeps doing the work of God. And though the world may speak against that person, in the end that person will be ashamed. Meekness shows forth that same thing. And we're to teach that meekness here. There's to be a great success against the enemy. And we see that the great success against the enemy here in this situation comes because that person was meek, had a clear conscience, had a good conversation. And in the end, that's where the victory is. It's not a passive thing. Look at the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. Against such there is no law. Meekness is included in the fruits of the Spirit. Now, who is more active than the Holy Spirit in the world that we live in? The Holy Spirit is currently and presently working in the hearts of each and every believer. The, the Spirit is all over this world doing great exploits through the believer. But not only that, the Holy Spirit is active within the ministry of reproving the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The Holy Spirit is busy, and yet one of the fruits of the Spirit is this meekness that we see here presented, and yet some people would say that meekness is passive. Ah, there's nothing more active, though. I, 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 I wager there's nothing more active than the Holy Spirit and His workings in this world. The fruit of the Spirit is meekness, and that is one of the great activities of the Holy Spirit. So how can we say that, the, that meekness is something that is passive. Next thing we see is meekness is indifference. People often say that meekness is indifference. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. 
all these accusations that people make, or all these uh, misconceptions that people make about meekness, about the behavior of meekness, about the person that is meek, uh, it's not right. Meekness is what it was exhibited by my Lord when he came and entered triumphantly into his, his kingdom upon this world. M meekness is great strength. Meekness is great leadership. Meekness gets results. Meekness is not indifference. Meekness is love. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And there's again another action. It's not a passive. It's a walking worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So we see here that Meekness is not an action of indifference. And I think a lot of people will, will see somebody that is meek and think that they just don't care. Think that they just have no emotional um, dog in the fight. That they have no desire to get into situations. Um, I know I've often, I've often heard if I'm staying out of a situation that, that's, oh, you, you just don't care. You know? um, but meekness is, is not indifference. It is not a, a not caring. It is, in fact, an act of love. The Bible here says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. So, so the exhibition of meekness and lowliness and long suffering and forbearing and endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and desiring that, that men wouldn't fight and be separated and, and, and break apart and, uh, and fight with one another. That desire is to the end that there would be one body, there would be one spirit, and the unity of the spirit would go forth, and it's all done in love. It's all done out of love. Worthy. Walk worthy in meekness, forbearing one another in love. The Bible says that love covereth all sins. The Bible says that charity faileth not, and charity, I believe, is the outward show of love. The most powerful form of love that we know of is charity in Amen. the Bible. And that love is expressed through lowliness, through meekness, through long-suffering one with another, and that is expressed best within the body of believers at your local congregation. It's also expressed best in the body of the believers far and wide, in the bigger community that we know of, wherewith we can express lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, endeavoring, desiring that there would be one mind, that there would be peace, that there would be the bond, the unity amongst brethren. Meekness is not indifference, it's an act of love to appropriate, to set aside your power in order that somebody else would get their way, in order that somebody else would get their say, in order that somebody else, yes, could even step on your toes. Meekness just puts that power aside and gives all power and glory to God on high. Put on meekness is what we're charged. Ephesians, uh, Colossians, sorry. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. In verse 3. Nope, verse 12. Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, again, another action. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, longsuffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So when we're not meek, when we're not putting charity above all things. When we're not exhibiting meekness, we get involved in quarrels. But if we're showing meekness, if we've put on mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, we're able to forbear one another. We're able to forgive one another. We're able to put quarrels aside. We're able to, as Christ forgave us, forgive others. And we do it through charity. And that's the bond of perfectness. That's what brings us as Christians together. That's what brings us here at Sound Words Baptist as a body together. Is if in meekness we set others up. If in meekness we take our power and lay it aside. If in meekness we, yes, lead and we're strong. But most of the time we just simply wait and watch and we're silent. Meekness, again, it's not passive, but it is active, and it does great things through God to the glory of God. That's how we have to act out. That's how we have to behave ourselves. Put on meekness, and above all, put on charity. When we're not meek, we break down. When we're not meek, we, we hurt others, so we get hurt. Right? Because, because meekness takes the hurt. It allows it to, to, to come upon you and to just roll off your back. 
We hide when we're scorned. We bend when we're bruised. Meekness takes a lot of punishment, but knows when to push back. And we need to have that understand. We need to take what's being thrown at us and in meekness allow it to come upon us using the power that we have from God only in appropriate times. Who's meeker but our Savior? Look in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 53. We'll be done. Isaiah 53. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly. In Isaiah chapter 53, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Look at this. Look what the Lord faced in meekness. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne. Remember we talked about meekness bearing? Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. So he did bear our sorrows, and yet we esteemed it as, as if he was just smited by God. As if he really he, he deserved it. Verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He didn't deserve it. We did. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. This is the truth here. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So meekness understands that people, hey, they want their own way. People want to do their own things. What meekness does is it takes that desire that people have to be um, to be in their own will, and it allows room for them. Meekness just simply steps aside. Meekness could stop the situation. Meekness could change the ways of others. And yet, when meekness has everyone turning to their own way, it simply allows them, gives them place, and that's what Christ did. And the Lord took the iniquities, took the own ways, took the desires, the iniquities, the chastisement that was deserved, the Lord took it and put it upon Jesus Christ. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Look at this. Yet he opened not his mouth. What a lesson there. Oppressed. Afflicted. Right? We just had all of our transgressions, all the things that we have done placed upon the Lord. Everything that I'm guilty of and I'm attacking the Lord with. I'm, 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 I'm sinning against him. I'm breaking his commandments. I'm oppressing him. I'm afflicting him. I'm... I'm pushing back. I'm rebelling. I'm fighting against him. I'm mocking him. I'm scourging him. Right? Because that's what people often do. They'll attack with their words what they themselves are guilty of. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened on his mouth. He had no need to defend himself. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. And we see there, again, the, the play, again, the action, again, the activity that came upon God, came upon Jesus Christ himself, but in meekness, he took it. We know the Lord took upon himself the form of a servant. We know the Lord took upon himself, here it says, the iniquities of us all. All those things that he was not deserving of, he in meekness and in lowliness, and though he could, put it to rest and stop it. He proceeded. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And this is why. This is why the Lord did this. This is why Jesus Christ went through this. This is why Jesus Christ exhibited meekness before the people that rejected him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And here's where the power comes to fruition. Here's where Christ, though smitten, Christ, though put down, Christ, though having the, trans, tra, uh, the transgressions of everyone upon them, Christ, oppressed, afflicted, put down, laying with the wicked, in the grave with, his wick, with the wicked, rich in his death. Here's where Christ pleases the Lord through that. He's put to grief. 
His soul is an offering for sin. But God shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. What does that mean? The pleasure, the will, the desire of God Almighty shall prosper in the right hand of Christ. He never, he never didn't have that power, but he relinquished it in order that he might please the Lord here. He shall see the travail of his soul shall be satisfied. What a gift. God was so angry with the wicked every day and still is. And yet he's satisfied by the travail of Christ. By his knowledge shall many righteous servants justify many. So the righteous go forth because of the knowledge, because they understand Christ, because they know of all that Christ has done for them. Many are justified, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So we see here God, Jesus Christ himself, whipped, beaten, mocked, spit upon. We see him having transgressions upon him, though he sinned not. We see him oppressed, we see him afflicted. Though he dis and then he despised the shame. God put off all of these things that could that he could have done. And that's one of the things I want to I want to focus on here is, is that he had the power to stop this. God had, the Bible says, legions of angels waiting at his beck and call in order to stop this. And yet in meekness, he allowed, in order that he would instruct those that oppose himself, in order that he would bear their sins, in order that he would please the Lord, in order that bruised and beaten, put to grief, put to shame, offering for sin, and descending down to hell for three days and three nights. Though Christ did all those things, it was all to the end that in meekness he would take the power that he had and use it appropriately when he rose from the dead, when he became triumphant, when he div was divided the portion with the great, when the power and pleasure of the Most High God was in his hand, and that was how it was going to prosper, when he poured out his soul unto death and though made intercession for the transgressors that put him into the death that he faced. And God did all of those things. He did it in meekness. And I believe meekness is quite often a misunderstood, misrepresented, a mistaken characteristic of the Christian life. The misconception of meekness is that it is something that is weak. The misconception of meekness is that it is, it is a virtue only to followers. But I, I hazard it for strength and strong leaders. The misconception of meekness is that it is passive, but it gets results. Meekness is not indifference, it is love. And who, who greater to exhibit meekness than Christ himself? And what greater example do we have to follow after? If we would be meek like our Lord, what a great world we could have.